So this is my first message as an evangelist, which, which makes things even more nervous than they normally are. But um, So the title for my message is Where the Purpose of a Thing is Unknown, Abuse is Inevitable. So abuse is defined as application to a wrong purpose or misuse. So another way to say it is where the purpose of a thing is unknown, misuse is bound to happen. Sorry, just a little nervous. So everything has a purpose. Brother Tim said it perfectly. He pretty much said my message in his testimony. So I thank you for the confirmation on um, what the Lord has given me. But everything has a purpose. A chair is used to be sat on. Brushes are used to take tangles out of our hair. Our eyes are used to see, and our mouth is used to speak. And in our society, it's common to see abuse. People abusing each other, whether it be physically, emotionally, or verbally. People mistreating their own bodies with alcohol, illegal drugs, prescription drugs, and to the extreme of trying to commit suicide or committing suicide. People abuse the sanctity of their marriage. The world has learned that this is an expected way of life nowadays. Not saying that any of us should endure it, but nobody's surprised when it happens anymore. There's almost been a desensitization, desensitization of this type of lifestyle because this stuff happens on a constant basis. Being a nurse at the hospital, I see this often. We've had multiple suicide patients who've tried to take their life, whether it be because of their unhappiness with themselves or a spouse or their boyfriend made them mad that day so they decided to walk in front of a bus. We, I've seen people that have overdosed. I've seen people that have, are basically killing themselves, but they don't care enough about their body to make changes in their lifestyle. But what about people who are living for the Lord? Abuse and living for the Lord should never be in the same sentence. It's like oil and water. It just, living for the Lord and abuse don't mix well. So if someone asked you what your purpose was, what would your response be? What would my response be? I know I have days that I think I'm just Sam. Nothing more, nothing less. And what about the days you remember that you made a mistake in the past and you question yourself? You don't question yourself, you question the Lord. How can God use a person like me? Thoughts like, I will never know as much as this brother or sister. I can't sing like so-and-so. I can't preach like him or her. God won't hear my prayer. These thoughts make our purpose become blurred. We may second guess, was I really called to have a place in the kingdom of God? And then confusion sets in. And the next thing you know is that you don't know. You don't remember what your purpose is. And once you lose that sight, things get lost. Fellowship becomes irritating. Worship is a struggle. Judgment of others set in. And prayer is time consuming. So when people begin to function outside the Lord's purpose, it not only affects the individual, but those around them. On Wednesday, Evangelist Freeman preached about enjoying your salvation and how for us to be able to continue to enjoy our salvation, we cannot but go back to what we were delivered from. So her message on Wednesday was confirmation on what the Lord had been putting on my heart. If we could go to Mark chapter 15, verse 29. I have a lot of scriptures, but most of them I'll just read. But this one, this is the heavy one. Mark chapter 15, and I'm going to read verses 29 through 32. If I can get an amen when we're there. Amen. So Mark 15, verse 29, we're going to go down to 32. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, 
Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priests, mocking, said among themselves with the scribes, He saved others, himself he cannot save. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. And that they that were with and they that were crucified with him reviled him or taunted him. So this is about when Jesus was on the cross being crucified. So as he's standing up there, not standing, but hanging up there, this is one of the most extreme cases of abuse manifested through the unbelief. So Jesus was mocked, he was taunted, he was physically abused until death, all because his purpose wasn't understood. Us as Christians can sometimes be downplayed, not only by the world, but by ourselves. We think, yes, I believe in God, I'm a Christian. But we're not just Christians. The Bible tells me in Galatians 3, 26 through 27, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. So remember the part, ye are all the children. In Galatians 4, 7, it says, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So once again, we're considered sons and daughters and heirs of Christ. John 1, 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. 2 Corinthians 6.18 And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So through those scriptures, there's a reoccurring theme that we are not just a Christian, but we're a son and a daughter of a God. So once we get that concept, I know I'm a son and a daughter of God, you have to understand who your father is. Who is Jesus Christ? Throughout the Bible, God can be referred to over a hundred types of different biblical names. The Alpha, the Omega, the Apostle, Bridegroom, the I Am, El Shaddai, Jehovah, Yeshua, Elohim. But the one I want to focus on the most is mentioned in Revelations, chapter 19, verse 16. And he hath on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And in the same book of Revelations, chapter 17, it says, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. So this means if our Father is a King, then we are his children, then collectively we make up the royal family. So at the Church of the Apostolic Road, we are considered a royal family. So royalty, what does that mean? Sometimes I think I don't feel like royalty. I mean my outfit, for the most part, is Walmart <clears throat> and Salvation Army. So when I think of royalty, I think of all these high fashion designers and they have all this money, and they have great cars, names that I'm, my son knows all the names of those fancy cars. Jewelry, because this is what is depicted in our media. This is what our world says royalty is. You know you've made it when you've made this much money. You have this many followers on Instagram. You have YouTube followers. All of that stuff, that's what the world says. You know you made it when you have this. But we can't relate to this type of world royalty because this is the world's royalty. We're not conformed to this world, but we're supposed to be transformed by the renewing of our mind and according to God's will. In 2 Peter 2.9, it says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, peculiar people that you should show forth praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So now we're sons and daughters of the king, and he tells us that he pulled us out of darkness. 
so and brought us into the light so when our past wants to come back we need to remember that we've already been taken out of this situation we've already been delivered from what the sin that we were in the Lord already forgave that sin and we can't leave, live in the past anymore this was something Freeman also evangelist Freeman also talked about on Wednesday is that for us to be able to continue to um, receive his blessings and his promises that we cannot focus on the past anymore I read a quote one time and it was talking about people who dwell in the past and it says when your memories get bigger than your vision you will die out to your future meaning if you're constantly living in the past of what you did once what was that you're not focusing on what's in front of you and what is to come with royalty also comes privileges royalty is known to have power and authority if you think about the king and queen in England back in the times they held all types of power and authority over everyone that lived in their land they were the ones that made the laws and said this is how things are going to be and everybody has to follow Jesus himself tells us in Luke that we are given the power over the enemy yes. and that sub spirits are sh subject unto us. In Mark, Jesus once again tells us that in his name we can cast out devils, we can lay hands on the sick, and they will be healed. So we have privileges. We also have an abundant amount of resources. The word tells me that we have an abundant amount of mercy and grace and that we serve an awesome God. With him, the simple people become glorious, the plain become royalty, the unknown become the known. In the Old Testament, Noah was just the crazy guy in town who decided to build an ark. Rahab was the faithful harlot. Samson was just a Nazarite with an extraordinary strength. These are just a few examples of people that were frowned upon by the people around him. The world didn't see the value in these people through faith, in the values in these people, but through their faith and obedience, they made an impact. They made an impact for the advancement of the kingdom, and they were key players, no different than what you and I are. In 2 Timothy 1.9, it says, Who hath saved us, called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose, and gave which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. So that means, once again, Brother Tim alluded to this. He knew us before we were in our mother's womb. He had a purpose set aside for us before the world, before there was water and trees even on this earth. So we have to be pretty special for him to think of us that far in advance. In Romans 11:29, it says, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance, meaning that once God says something, he's not going to take it back. He's not going to go back on his word. And just, Pastor has said this scripture many a times, but just to put cement on that one, in Numbers 23:19, it says that God is not a man, that he should lie, neither the son of man, that he should repent. Hath he said, and hath he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall not he make it good? So meaning, if God says, I've called you for this purpose, I've called you to sing, I've called you to the play the tambourine, I've called you to evangelize, I've called you to preach, that those special gifts, whether it's a gift of discernment, a gift of interpreting in tongues, he's not going to take it back because then that would make the scripture null and void and that that is not what he can do. He's not a man that he could lie. I sometimes, I forget that I've been given, I sometimes forget what I've been given by the Lord because I'm too wrapped up in school or in work and at times I feel overwhelmed by the things of this world. And sometimes I can stress myself out enough that I feel sick to my stomach. So it's crazy to think that when someone feels a certain way strong enough mentally that you can become physically sick. Right. So 
it's safe to say that mentally I was causing my own physical abuse. And when you're in that situation, it's like it's just a whirlwind of emotions. And until you step outside, it's like if you could take yourself out of the situation, stand yourself next to yourself, and actually look at the situation from an outstander's point of view, it's, it's interesting. And um, I recently had to do it, and it, it was very eye-opening to see what was happening um, because you could see how the devil kind of plays a role in it and he's slick not that I give him any any room or any credit for anything but if I'm feeling anxious or overwhelmed it's quickly turns to become I become irritated I am quick to anger because how else can I channel these feelings it's like being caught up like I said in a whirlwind it's a tornado so what's really happening? I forgot to put the Lord first. The Bible tells me that when I seek the kingdom of God first, all things will be added unto me. So God is not a God of chaos. He's not a God of confusion or anxiousness or being overwhelmed because we shouldn't feel overwhelmed because we know the Bible clearly says he will not give us anything more than we can bear. But in that moment, I forgot. I've forgotten who I was. And we know that the, day, the devil is just waiting for us to slip. He's just chilling out in spots. And as soon as he sees that there's a peace or a, a linger of the unknown within us, he says, All right, it's my time. I'm going to go. I'm going to see what I can take. But the funny thing is, when we're in those situations, the devil really actually doesn't have to take anything because we're handing him, here's my joy, here's my happiness, here's my peace, because we're too busy entertaining the anxiety, the anger, that he just stands there with his hands out and we're just putting it all in his hands. And at this point, until we want to take it back, he's just going to hold on to it. So in those situations, I've learned that as soon as I start to feel overwhelmed, and I mean, my husband, he's great at saying, you know, you've got this, it's going to be fine. But it's when I remind myself, and usually I have to think of um, Evangelist Hernandez, it, it, Hernandez, it always helps me, all of a sudden there's a peace. Because then I, I'm reminded myself quickly of the purpose that I was predestined for. Yay! And I have to, it's, it's about reminding myself. I have to remember what the word says. The word says that we are, king, are sons and daughters of God. The word says that we belong to a royal, royal family. The word says I've been handpicked by God Mighty himself. That we were chosen before the foundation of the world. That we were given power and authority over the enemy. The word says we were called out of darkness and called with a holy calling. The word says I've been promised blessing and gifts that will not be taken back. The word says I have a purpose, and this purpose doesn't include the affairs of this world. The word tells me that the Lord doesn't make mistakes, and I am perfectly and wonderfully made. So the next time that you feel like a nobody, remember that God can take anybody and make them a somebody because he's the Lord of Lord and King of Kings. The prayers of anybody who feel like a nobody will be answered when the person makes contact with God because, what did you say earlier? That that, that curtain is no longer up. We don't, we, we have straight access to the Lord that when we need him, he's going to hear our cry. And the greatest somebody in the world, in the universe, is God. So I've said all this to say that we are somebody. We, we have a purpose. And when we lose sight of that, that's when abuse is going to come in. It's bound to happen. And the only way that we could keep that from happening is to be able to just keep our eyes on the Lord and be there for each other. Because when I lose my purpose, 
then I am no help to Sister Jasmine. We're supposed to be helpers of each other. We're yes. supposed to be there. We're supposed to confess our sins one to another. Yes. So how am I supposed to hear you if I'm too wrapped up in my own world? What help am I to you and vice versa? I'm supposed to be the help meet to my husband. So when I lose my purpose, how am I able to help him because I can't even help myself? When I lose my purpose, how am I supposed to be part of the ministerial staff to help edify the saints of the church? I can't. And it's the same thing for anybody, whether you're in the ministerial staff or not. When you lose sight of what the purpose that God has had predestined for you, then you're not any help to yourself or to anybody else. And we have to remember that we are that royal priesthood, that we have power and dominion over the things underneath us. So this is just encouragement. This message has been encouraging for me. And um, I just want to say thank you, Elder Tino. Anytime I have questions, I text him. And sometimes I'm not the most optimistic about these situations. But then I, he reminded me easily that this has nothing to do with me. This has nothing to do with Evangelist Wazalewski. That is the Lord. That this is that I'm just a mere vessel for him to work through and that this is the first time that I really took it to heart that it's it's not about me stressing out and trying to make everything perfect because it's it's coming from the Lord and anything that comes from the Lord is perfectly and wonderfully made so pray my strength in the Lord